There's a burning topic for this afternoon is CPU isolation. It's, I guess it's not on the website because Frédéric is always... Uh, well. I always <laughs> reply very late yeah. to emails. <laughs> so this is a surprise. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm Frédéric Weisbecker and I work for uh, Red Hat. Uh, I work on the kernel, uh, upstream and uh, the downstream as well sometimes. And um, uh, these times I've been working on CPU isolation. So what kind of isolation? So this is a user space application isolated against uh, kernel space code. So basically it's when you run a user space application and it's disturbed by kernel code. But before uh, going into details, uh, let's uh, remind some very basics. So what's a kernel? Um, so I've been thinking about that all night long. What exactly is a kernel? We have been talking about that for three days and uh, actually nobody defined it really. So this is uh, I first thought it could be a library, but it's not exactly a library. Um, maybe we can just stick with the fact it's a service. A uh, service which uh, provides hardware in a unified way to user space. And uh, this kernel service is provided uh, in two main ways. Uh, kernel code can be synchronized when it's explicitly requested by the user, um, or it's asynchronized, in the case it triggers and preempts or interrupts the user uh, in a more or less predictable way. So, the synchronized kernel codes, um, system calls are synchronized kernel codes, uh, I've tried to find some more ways to trigger a kernel service in a synchronized way, but I cannot find any. Do you have any idea? Or... Divide by zero. What? Divide by zero. Divide by zero. Actually, I'm coming to that right after, yeah. But um, no, nothing else? Okay. <laughs> Asynchronous kernel code, so it's almost all the rest, mostly interrupts, hardware interrupts, which gather a lot of families. There is the scheduler tick, there are timers, there are hardware interrupts, and uh, soft IRQs, which are interrupts running without masking uh, interrupts, which means an interruptible interrupt. And the not so synchronous, asynchronous kernel code. Oh no, it's after. Okay, so I'm going to rewind it. After. So uh, the not so synchronous or asynchronous kernel code, which is the exceptions, which means it triggers on user code execution. And sometimes it's because you requested it. And sometimes it, it's a bit of a surprise like page faults, for example. So in the case of breakpoints uh, or a single step, for example, so that's kind of synchronous kernel code because you requested the kernel to, to uh, trap the place you asked for. And uh, go back to asynchronous kernel code. So it's on the higher level, uh, the kernel threads. Um, so in that case, it's a lot about um, kernel tasks to, to do a lot of background uh, jobs to maintain subsystems like memory or, uh, or sometimes also IRQs which are turned into threads or write back and stuff like that. So Sometimes the kernel code can be considered to be noise. So it's a, well, it depends on semantics. Most of the time the kernel code, if it's not about IOs, uh, the kernel code is mostly in invisible. It's not noticeable. Uh, most of the time it's, it's about microseconds or milliseconds of execution. So it, it's usually 
<laughs> not burdening. But it can be annoying when you run some extreme workloads like real time or uh, high performance computing. So in the case of uh, real time, so real time uh, is about deterministic response latency. So you have a critical piece of uh, code, uh, usually a very short one, which when it's woken after an event needs to be run uh, immediately and without being preempted by another task. So it's a very high priority task. The way to implement real time uh, is uh, uh, using very um, high priority tasks that cannot be preempted. So we use the SCAD 5.4 scheduler class, for example. Um, all the kernel code that is usually unpreemptible is made preemptible. Uh, for example, the locks, spinning locks like spin locks, which uh, wait for a lock to be uh, released before taking it, uh, are turned into mutexes, which means that the lock, uh, the, 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 the task is going to wait for uh, sleep, and block for a lock until it gets released. So if a uh, high priority task executes and waits for the CPU, it can preempt um, code that usually spins for a lock because that code can sleep. And uh, IRQs, that usually cannot be preempted because it's a raw piece of code that needs to be executed very fast and it's not implemented through tasks. So it's a raw piece of code. They are turned into uh, threads. Uh, so we keep the, the very tiny part of the interrupt which usually masks the interrupt so that they cannot uh, mess up. And the rest of the interrupt is executed in a task, separate task. And also priority inheritance. Um, um, for example, a task, when uh, the, your real-time task is waiting for the CPU because another task uh, is taking a lock. So uh, in that case, the task is going to sleep and give the CPU to the, to the real-time task. This is uh, implemented using lock, locking priority inheritance. And on the other uh, side of the extreme use cases, uh, oh no, that's after I'm missing it. Um, oh, okay. There is uh, still a piece of code that cannot be preempted. It's the scheduler tick. So I'm going to that later. No, uh, high performance computing. So this is a very opposite side of the, of the use cases. Uh, if, we, if we take a big spectrum of, of use cases, we have the very uh, latency sensitive tasks, which are the real time on the extreme side. Then we have desktop and maybe mobile phones. And after we go to the, um, let's say uh, CPU bound, uh, or very fast I.O. bound uh, tasks, for example, servers. And then on the extreme side, you have HPC, which is high performance computing. Uh, usually it's about uh, very CPU bound tasks, which means we have a lot of computation to perform on <laughs> data. Um, so it's not a, much about I.O.s. There are few IOs in uh, HPC. It's mostly CPU running all the time perform, performing uh, calculation. And uh, in this kind of use case, we want the CPU to, to really maximize its capacity. So we want to take the most out of a CPU resources in the case of HPC. So we really want to get rid uh, of um, of kernel noise in that case. In a single CPU, it doesn't make a huge difference to get rid of, uh, of interrupts, which only steal a few milliseconds of CPU time. But if you take, uh, because usually HPC uses uh, computers with a large number of CPUs, so uh, if you multiply this time gained uh, by the number of CPUs, you get sometimes some interesting numbers. 
Um, especially when the timer interrupts steals CPU time, it doesn't only steals CPU time, but also CPU cache, because it trashes the cache uh, that can be used by HPC tasks. So there are a lot of, of things in the game. And it's not only about CPU time, but also uh, HPC tasks after uh, performing computation. Um, all these tasks, uh, in the end, um, meet at a um, completion barrier. And if uh, all these tasks are interrupted, they are delayed in their uh, meetup on the, on the completion, and if you, again, multiply that by the number of CPUs, you get quite an interesting uh, win. So let's now talk about kernel noise readance. Uh, the very first and the biggest step that is annoying is getting rid of the tick, because the tick that is, has a lot of dependencies. So first, let's uh, remind what the tick is. So the tick is a uh, periodic uh, event implemented by way of an interrupt, which happens at a user-defined rate. It usually it depends on the architectures, but it usually ranges from 50 to 1,000 hertz. And as you can see on the picture, it makes a huge difference because it's uh, the difference between 1,000 inter per second against 100 only, sometimes 50. Uh, when do we choose a high value or a low value? It depends on the latency requirements. For example, if you have a desktop machine, um, you might want to use a very large value because... Um, the short delays between interrupts uh, is the cause of, of timers' granularity to be, to be expanded. So um, with a good uh, timer granularity, your tasks get woken up uh, more often and, more, uh, and, and faster. So it's usually a good choice for a desktop and maybe for um, mobile phones, perhaps. Uh, on the other hand, a huge value um, uh, is a lot of interrupts, and a lot of interrupts eats quite some CPU time. So if you have performance-sensitive workloads, you might better choose a low value like 100. Uh, on the other hand, you might experience some user-visible latencies in that case. So huge value is more for desktops and low value is rather for servers or high performance computing as well. The purpose of the scheduler tick, there are many of them. Um, the most important one I think is to gather the time uh, consumed by a task on the CPU. Uh, as well as statistics from the scheduler. Um, the scheduler pulls on the task, checking all the time if it has uh, taken too much CPU, and if another task is waiting for the CPU, it's going to preempt that task. So uh, the scheduler tick is also there to ensure run robin, uh, well leveraged run robin on the CPU, and also across CPUs. So if you have too much tasks on the CPU, it's, the tick is also there to ensure there is a good load balancing between CPUs. So it's about local fair scheduling and also global fair scheduling. Uh, RCU state machine. RCU, uh, it's, I don't know if you, who knows RCU actually? Okay, that's quite interesting. So RCU is a read copy update, it's a lockless. Um, uh, synchronization algorithm, which provides um, synchronization guarantees that are not as hard as real locks, but it provides soft guarantees like uh, um, life cycle of an object. I cannot enter into details because it's going to be, it itself deserves 
60 slides at least. So yeah, and uh, timekeeping. Uh, the schedule, the um, kernel maintains several timestamps. Um, GFIS is the internal timestamps used by the kernel, which is used to uh, uh, implement low resolution timers, for example. And get time of day is the user visible clock uh, that you can use at a high frequency because it's you, you, the update happened on the tick. It doesn't happen on, on get time of day calls. So uh, that's what makes that clock quite scalable. And finally, the timer callback, which are implemented using GFIs. So those are the typical low resolution timers. And those expire using the, the timer uh, scheduler tick. And since this uh, scheduler tick is annoying for uh, extreme workloads, we want to get rid of it. Um, the very first step to get rid of the scheduler tick happened in, uh, I think, 2.6.27, I think. So it was like 2007, I think. Uh, this feature was called Dintix Idle, or uh, No Hertz, if you heard about it. So uh, the purpose is to stop the tick uh, when the CPU doesn't have any job to do. So of course, if the CP, uh, well, previously before that feature arrived, the, the timer tick was executing all the time at a fixed frequency. And there was problems uh, because those interrupts woke up the CPU all the time and we had some power consumption uh, issues with that. So the purpose was uh, to uh, spare some power uh, when the CPU doesn't have anything to do. Uh, but then we wanted to go further because um, uh, real-time and HPC want to get rid of the timer tick also when the CPU is busy. So uh, that's the reason why we went one step further and we implemented full Dintix. So no, it's not only about uh, stopping the tick when the CPU has nothing to do, but also when the CPU has to do in user space. So uh, this comes at a real cost. Uh, for example, all the um, features that use the tick that I talked there, so we had to re-implement all these features without using this periodic event that the scheduler tick is. So for example, the time accounting. You know the command top, you know, which uh, checks all the time the tasks that are executing on the CPU and it sorts all these tasks by uh, uh, CPU consumption and memory consumption. So this is uh, implemented using the internal kernel uh, CPU time accounting. So when, uh, when the task runs, the tick checks all the time uh, where it has interrupted the task. If it has interrupted the task in uh, user space, it accounts one GFI on the user space statistics. And if it's on the kernel, it accounts it on the kernel uh, fields. So this is the easy way, but without the tick, we still need to uh, maintain this time accounting, which is necessary for applications like top. So instead of polling on the task with a fixed frequency rate, uh, now we put probes on user space, kernel space boundaries. We record the time uh, when we, uh, for example, switch from kernel to user space. And then on the next boundary cross, we account the time that was spent either in user space or kernel space. But this comes at a real cost because uh, round trip to kernel can happen very frequently if you run an IO bound uh, application. And yeah, usually we execute much more syscalls than ticks. So um, yeah, this comes at a real cost. It's really 
suitable only for uh, workloads uh, based on very CPU-bound uh, <coughs> tasks, which means tasks that stay most of the time in user space doing calculation and not much IOs. Yep. So uh, the tick stays on CPU zero. That's a very good question. Uh, GFIS continues to be maintained and uh, get time of day as well. Uh, because the CPU zero takes over this, uh, this update all the time. So CPU zero always keeps the tick. That's the lamp to sacrifice to get that feature. Yeah. Um, when we have timer callbacks, which were implemented using the tick, uh, if some are enqueued on the CPU, we really cannot do much. We have to trigger a tick if we have an expired timer. So the only way to solve that is to move those timer callbacks, again on CPU zero, but it could be any, any CPU that is not uh, running in uh, a full DINTIX mode. Usually it's CPU zero. Uh, but the problem is we cannot do that with all timers, only the timers that are not assigned to one precise CPU. So this only applies on unbound timers. But I think it covers most of the timers. And the assigned timers, well, they, we need to deal with them uh, case by case. Some workloads trigger uh, per CPU timers and some don't. So a uh, read copy update, which is uh, that uh, lockless synchronization mechanism. Um, in order to perform its uh, lifecycle object guarantee, uh, RCU uses the tick. It pulls all the time on RCU uses on, by the current task, and uh, it reports to the global state machine of RCU which is based on global grace periods, and but I, I'm not going to, to enter into details, but uh, this is based on the tick, and we had to find a solution for that too. Um, we also need to find solution to execute callbacks, which are um, uh, functions executed by RCU when a, a life cycle grace period expires. So all these, uh, all these tasks are now performed again by CPU zero. So th the usual way to get rid of, uh, of, of mechanism like the tick is to offload the work performed by this uh, periodic event to another CPU. And this is what we do with RCU. Um, and also, um, when the task runs in user space, which is the ring where we are most interested for HPC. Um, we exclude the CPU, uh, the full Dintix CPU from the global RCU state machine. So this, this is, uh, this is uh, the same system that we use when the CPU is idle. It excludes itself from the global RCU state machine and so it doesn't need anymore to use the tick. So those kind of, of tricks we've been using. Uh, they are very useful, but again, they, they come at a cost because CPU zero uh, now has to handle all these works. So when you use uh, CPU isolation and, and full dentics, uh you always have to sacrifice one CPU uh, to handle all the housekeeping work. Now comes the um, more or less easy part. Um, RQs that can be very annoying, especially for HPC because real time um, doesn't much care about IRQs anymore because they are implemented by uh, threaded IRQs. So it's not anymore a problem on real time, but for HPC it stays a problem. We don't want IRQs to interrupt CPUs executing uh, very CPU bound workloads. So the easy way to, to solve this is to, to just go into procfs and write the, the, the IRQs affinities for uh, all of them. 
again, move all that to CPU zero, which handles all the housekeeping tasks. Uh, of course, there will be one IRQ that you cannot move the affinity, which is the tick, but we have other solutions for that. Uh, NMIs are really special beasts, so they are non-maskable interrupts, um, usually used for debugging or uh, performance measurements. Uh, it's used, for example, by perf events, uh, previously uh, named perf counters. Um, it, it's used to trigger uh, overflow events, for example, if you count cycles, an enemy is triggered after, like, I don't know, a few thousand cycles, and then MI uh, triggers and, and records the call, the call chain, for example. So it, it's used to, to uh, take snapshots of, of a task uh, while doing performance measurements. Uh, it's also used by the lockup watchdog. When you, have, uh, when you detect a hard lockup or soft lockup, uh, we use NMIs in that case. So the only solution is to really avoid using perf, of course, perf events. Well, if you have very extreme workloads, typically you, you don't want to use um, performance measurements uh, besides. And neither do you want to use the lockup watchdog because, uh, well, it's always useful to detect kernel internal uh, uh, issues, but if you run very, uh, very sensitive workloads, uh, very CPU-bound sensitive workloads, you might want to get rid of, the, of that. And you can, you can actually deactivate the lockup watchdog. Uh, in the case of no hertz full, it's now uh, deactivated. Yeah, it's deactivated by default on no hertz full, uh, full dintix CPUs. Uh, but you can also uh, tweak the um, CPU mask on CSFS, I think. Uh, now the kernel threads, uh, those I think are the most complicated issue with uh, th the threaded part of the problem. Uh, the, for, I mean, the work use. Uh, work use, uh, th there are different kinds of work use. Work use are the, are the internal uh, system used by the kernel to, to execute asynchronous tasks. Usually it's about um, the, the, the heavy part of an interrupt, hardware interrupt, that needs to be to execute with uh, interrupts enabled and, and, and preemptibility. Um, there are several types of work use. We have per CPU work use, which are uh, work use affined to one CPU, so we cannot offload this work to another CPU. We have no choice but to execute a work use if one is queued on the per CPU one. And we have the unbound work use, um, which are works that don't have any special affinity, except perhaps keeping an affinity on the current node to uh, keep some cache uh, pro um, proximity. Uh, so now we have a system to, uh, to affine the unbound work use, which has been implemented two releases ago. Uh, we have now a CPU mask in CSFS that you can uh, overwrite and move all these tasks. Again, I recommend to move that to CPU zero, which handles all the housekeeping. Uh, user mode helper, which is uh, really a, a gory detail of, uh, of uh, asynchronous kernel code. Uh, this, is, um, this is a hack that allows the kernel to perform user space code. Uh, it's usually um, used to load modules from the kernel. And this uh, user mode helper thing, well, it could happen all the time. So uh, we, we have been reported by some people that uh, this can be annoying for uh, extreme real-time users. So that too, we have uh, been able to assign it to CPU zero since, well, I think this the last latest RC1. And then we have the rest of kernel threads. Some of them are unbound, so you can find them using the proc uh, interface, like pretty any other task. 
And then we have the kernel threads that are uh, affined to special CPUs. And if that's the case, well, I think you're screwed if you see uh, affined kernel threads in your workload. It means that you really need to, to, uh, to uh, report it, I guess, to the kernel community or um, you need to put your hands inside, I think. You don't have the choice. And, uh, well, this part is not really serious. I mean, exceptions are triggered. Uh, if exceptions are really a burden for you, you need to use mlock, especially on the, for the page faults. Uh, page faults are the most annoying uh, kernel noise exceptions, uh, usually. But it's about IOs, so if you want to avoid that, you need to use mlock on the very special uh, critical sections that you want to uh, to um, pin on the memory to avoid page faults. And the rest, well, avoid ptrace and debugging if you don't want to see watch points, breakpoints. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And divide by zero, which is indeed a synchronous way to trigger a kernel code. Yeah, divide by zero. Okay, um, well, that's pretty much it. That was a short talk. Anybody has questions? Yeah. Not number exceptions? Yeah. Yes, I guess. It's, it's, yeah, I think so. It's a kernel exception, yeah. It's a kernel exception? Yes? Okay. I have no idea. Yeah. If it's a kernel exception, then yeah, you can trigger it as well. I have no idea. To be honest, I have no idea. Well, that's usually an accident. If you raise divide by zero or not a number, oh, well, yeah, except if you use maybe uh, C++ maybe and stuff like that. Yep. Oh, yeah, the, the no hertz full boot option, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we we have uh, sort of merged all these things. Uh, the no hertz full boot option, which is used to uh, um, to write all the, the the set the CPU set that you want to be no hertz full. And we have the ISL CPU um, boot option that is used to um, um, exclude a CPU set from the scheduler uh, domains, which means that the scheduler is not going to migrate tasks to uh, this CPU set. And also RCU no CB, which is the offloading of RCU callbacks. So when we um, define a set of CPU with the uh, no hertz full uh, boot option, it's automatically uh, included in ISOL CPUs and RCU no CBs as well. But uh, as of we are going to keep that RCU no CB automatic uh, inclusion. But for um, ISOL CPUs, we might actually step back because some people have reported issues. Like if you define every CPUs uh, uh, like uh, um, ISOL CPUs, uh, every time you launch a task, it's going to be um, uh, executed by only one CPU. So it's good if, if you only uh, uh, execute very uh, corner case or very extreme workloads. But if you want just to launch something normal, you have horrible performances. So we might, you, you better indeed um, 
use that ISOL CPUs as well. Yes, and and define the same CPU than in Norwood School, boot option. That was your question, or that was. It? I don't. Sorry, can you repeat? <laughs> mm-hmm. Ah, oh, yeah. What kind of process can be evicted if when we don't have ticks? Oh, any kind of process. Ah, it can be evicted, like uh, offline to another CPU. Well, pretty much any, as long as they are not assigned to uh, to. Uh, uh, to that CPU. But uh, yes, another requirement that I forgot to uh, write on the slides is you can run only one task on the CPU if you want to get rid of all ticks. Because otherwise the ticks must be there if you have several tasks competing on the same CPU in order to uh, maintain uh, preemption. So you need to run only one task per CPU. But that's usually what's done for HPC. So yeah, sorry, somebody, yeah. Yeah. So, so you mean the, the, that we need to uh, set up a CPU set in order to avoid load balancing? You, well, you can use CPU set to turn off load balancing. You can, yeah. Yeah, right. Hmm. That's one way to get rid of like, Yeah, actually that, that's, that's what we wanted to do in the first place. Then we thought that CPU set was maybe a dependency that some people wouldn't be interested in. But yeah, indeed, that's a very good uh, interface to, uh, to get rid of the load balancing. Yeah, yeah, right. Especially if you want to get rid of that uh, ISOL CPUs uh, uh, stuff that we are using now, with, which is a hack, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -mm. Yeah. Somebody, yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, indeed, if you run a SCAD 5 for task, well, let's say, like you said, we have four SCAD 5 tasks, or only one can execute at a time because there is no preemption with SCAD 5 So if we have only one task running, indeed, we don't really need a tick, yeah. SCAD 5 is uh, usually the, the prime choice for uh, full DIN ticks, although it only works for uh, only a few releases. I think now it works, yeah. You can run SCAD 5 for, uh, yeah. But that's recommended, isn't it? If you don't want to be encrypted, not only by the tick, but by other tasks or stuff like that, yeah. But if you have more than one SCAD 5 task, it still doesn't count. Doesn't it still check yeah. there's only one task? Uh, actually, I don't know. I need to check that, but... Uh, I think this is a special case. Yeah, maybe it's not yet handled. Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. For uh, SCAD RR, we need to keep preemption, so yeah. But for SCAD 5, oh, yeah, I don't know. I need to check the details. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's uh, part of the code that is being reworked. So, yeah, I think it's going to be handled on the development. Yep. Yep. In this case, when the or new uh, one process on the CPU, uh, would you have a difference if we schedule uh, the process in the repo compared to the uh, What kind of difference? In the time of the CPU cycles? Uh, well, yeah, but it's mostly about uh, avoiding to be preempted by uh, other tasks. So other than that, I don't think you're going to see... Uh, I mean, if you run a SCAD normal task that isn't preempted, well, usually it happens because there are work use or other stuff, but... Uh, a SCAD normal task compared to a SCAD FIFO task, if neither of 
those are preempted, I think performances are about the same. But if you run uh, the real-time tree, yes, you're going to see quite some differences because the implementation of very low latency uh, is sacrificed and in favor of or favor of um, uh, loss of performances, loss of throughput, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Even though this is important for folks on uh, the C tasks, it's actually made it really good for low power idle as well. But I'm curious um, because you reported that to me already. But I, I'm curious how how it actually happens to um, uh, end up with less power uh, consumption. Actually, in the, in the same way that you avoid interrupts, wakeups, IPIs. Oh, okay. So That's because we execute less current code. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 If you have two CPUs with uh, different performances, yeah, you might want to move all the housekeeping work to the little CPU and move the rest performance sensitive to the big. Yeah. Right. Ah, interesting. Yep. So I was wondering, is there any overlap with the jailhouse advisor that got discussed? Jail? Or jailhouse. Uh, so it tries to solve, I think, a similar problem where you have Linux running on your system, mm -hmm. but you can take some CPUs, your kernel does not touch them, on there, and you can run your workflow. So like we run a kernel on some CPUs and we use the other CPUs to run like another kernel, for example. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it might be quite some overlap uh, on the on the end result. I mean, if you if you really want to isolate some CPUs, well, it, it depends on your use case. But if you want to keep access to uh, the the kernel in one kernel unified, use its syscalls and all, then you might prefer to use uh, only one kernel. Well, we are working towards. Uh, running only one kernel and be able to completely isolate a CPU but still keep the ability to use the, the syscalls and, and yeah. So that, that's the really end result we are, we really want to, to achieve, yeah. We are still, we are getting closer but we are still far from it actually. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which tool do you advise to, to, to look up the WhatsApp? Ah. Maybe I actually have trace. Well, if you were, if you have only a user space code, you might want to use some pure user space profiling library. But if you have kernel code, um, you can use ftrace. I mean, if you still have some kernel code doing syscalls or stuff. You, yeah, you can use ftrace because it doesn't use interrupts of some sorts. It just records events to a ring buffer, but there is no, no other kind of events, no special wake-ups. Well, you might need to do some care to really avoid some wake-ups. Like if you use kernel shark, for example, I think it, there are some wake-ups from time to time if you have some events uh, in the queue to read. But if you, yeah, if you only use like trace events with ftrace, uh, I think you should be free of noise, I guess. 
you might have some performance loss because if you deactivate if you activate trace events you have some overhead but usually it's it depends which one actually yeah. but usually it's noise uh, site noise free doesn't trigger interrupts or wake ups right but yeah avoid anything based on ptrace or uh, breakpoints watch points single step because that triggers exceptions, so, yeah. Okay, no question anymore? Okay, thank you. Yeah.